Well, it's, it's great to, uh, to know that my uh, opening line was um, already taken because this question of how to fathom genocide is something that is unfathomable. But it took me back to my first university job. Um, I was a professor uh, up at a small liberal arts college in Canada. And, you know, new professor, uh, you're going to go and you're going to give a lecture on how to understand genocide to 5,000 high school students, and you have 20 minutes to explain how it happens and how they should understand this. So now I have 12 minutes, so clearly I've developed some skill at this um, over the years. But my problem today is the same one that I had that uh, minor decade ago when I was a, a new professor. How do you explain how modern, postmodern, pre-modern societies come to identify, isolate, and murder whole portions of their population, right? Because genocide doesn't just happen. Individuals, small groups don't affect genocide. This is state-sanctioned. There are organizations, there are moments that legitimizes that hatred that results ultimately not only in marginalization, deportation, but ultimately murder. So how do you explain that? How do you make it relevant? How do you make it relatable? We have all sorts of theories that help us do that. Maybe the most best, the best known or the most often cited is George Staunton's stages of genocide. There were eight, and there's now been revised to 10 stages of genocide. And they start with prejudice, and it moves all the way through to denial. And those stages, if we understand them, if we can recognize it, the theory is we can stop it. Our colleagues in Kigali, uh, the Kigali Genocide Memorial, they're very invested in something called peace education. So they're a society who is a post-genocidal society trying to come to some understanding of how to continue together. And they're committed to not only genocide education, but peace education. And their theory is based on the work of Irwin Staub in the continuum of violence, that there's a descent into violence that results in genocide. It too has stages, but there's also an ability to stop and to have a continuum of benevolence. And so what they're trying to determine is at what point can you help young people determine where they are in those continuums and perhaps reverse the descent and move towards benevolence. In our offices at the USC Shoah Foundation, our theory of change posits that there are three broad elements about understanding genocide. It starts with an idea, hatred, hatred of the other, that moves into developing interests, and then ultimately intent. And out of that intent becomes action, devastating actions. But those theories don't help us fathom genocide. Those theories don't help students in particular come to an understanding of how genocides are relatable. We live in a time where if something is not happening close to us, it's not relevant. So those theories, those statistics, those articles prompt students to ask me, why do I need to know this? I spend a good deal of my time, first as a director of education, explaining why students need to learn about the Armenian Genocide, the Holocaust, the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, or any of the other genocidal activities of the 20th and 21st centuries. And these theories get me part way but they don't help students to develop empathy or understanding. It doesn't make it fathomable. Our theory is that if we start to listen to the voices of those who witnessed and survived the genocides, we can cross that gap. We can make it more fathomable, more understandable through the development of critical thinking and empathy. So what we have here at the USC, at the USC Shoah Foundation, is an archive of audiovisual testimonies of witnesses and survivors of genocidal activity. Over 55,000 testimonies that range from 18 minutes to 18 hours that have been fully preserved, digitized, cataloged, and indexed to the minute by almost 70,000 keywords so that people can identify, access, find those moments in those stories, those powerful life stories that can help them understand. The largest group in the archive 
our survivors and witnesses of the Holocaust, but we've since added survivors and witnesses and soon perpetrators of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, the Nanjing Massacre, um, Cambodia, Guatemala, and Armenia. So starting in 2010 and working with the Armenian Film Foundation, we are fortunate to bring in the films of Michael Hagopian, and they've all been preserved, indexed, and made available through the Visual History Archive. That Visual History Archive is accessible in about 80 universities and museums around the world. Part of it's also available online. And those collection of almost 400 testimonies over the Armenian Genocide have become a wonderful resource in our educational platform, Eyewitness. And Eyewitness is available anywhere in the world, freely over the internet. It has about 2,200 testimonies, so a subset of those 55,000. But it's directly created for young people. Young people from grade two right up through university. And they have access to activities, clips, and full testimonies. We have 100,000 registered users in 80 different countries around the world, and they're listening to those voices. And those voices are what can make genocide fathomable. Those stories, those personal human stories. So when I'm trying to help a student understand, so I'm often in the archive, and trying to help a student understand something about identity, and I introduce them to a testimony um, from Ashraq Dishsanonian who talks about the loss of his identity, about losing his entire family, being adopted into a Turkish family, essentially, and not knowing who he was until very late in life. That resonates with students. Or we hear about someone who was bullied for years leading up to the genocide, beaten up almost every day on his way to school. That resonates. It's a human story. I introduced them to Elise Taft, who experienced some of the worst of the Armenian genocide with her family. She survived marches, deportation, typhus, the loss of most of her family. And she talks about it with such humanity. She explains what happens at Katma in color. So an individual can't help but be moved by the experience of her family taking in her primary school teacher and her daughter. In the midst of one of the most horrible moments, they were fortunate enough to have a tent when a rainstorm hit, and they took this woman in, this woman who had typhus. They rescued her, they brought her in, she died overnight. And Elise tells this story with such humanity, it's hard for students not to find themselves moved by that. It's hard for them not to make a connection between their own lives, examples of humanity that are happening around them, or examples of inhumanity that are happening around them. When Elise talks about the moment when she's outside of Damascus with her family, and she, it's pitch black, but she can see the light of her father's cigarette off to the side as he sits out as it snows for the first time in 40 years. And she walks over to him, and they're standing together looking up at the sky. And he points to the brightest star in a constellation he called the scales. And he says, you are my brightest star. And she thinks to herself, and she recounts in her testimony, how can he at that moment think of anything that's beautiful, familiar, and it speaks to resilience. And it helps the students, those young people, those individuals, the adults, consider. If we're looking at any of the stages from those theories, we can find stories from all of our collections. And the power of the consistency across those stories, the common features, when we, when Elisa's story can be mapped with a story from Me Freddie Metangua, from Kigali, and someone who survived the Holocaust. And students can see the same and similar processes. It helps them to realize the importance, the common features that human beings around the world at very different periods of time not only witnessed, but survived. So those powerful stories help bring them closer, helps bridge the gap.
one of my favorite uh, stories when talking about the way to counter denial, because denial really is the final stage of a, den of a genocide, and it's one particular with the Iranian genocide that we have to be conscious of and continue to fight through our education and other programs, is when Hayam Bonaparte talks about, and I, I believe he's a pharmacist, although it's not clear to me in the, the testimony, he talks about having no malice. So to have a conversation with a group of young people after he's described his experience, after they know some of those statistics and the, and the other amounts, and he talks about having no malice towards those who perpetrated this on his family. But that he's sad that the Turkish government, that even at that time the American government hadn't recognized the genocide, and how he envies that Germany took responsibility, and how powerful that was for him, but that he still has no malice that he still believes the world can be a good place, is a remarkable moment for students to have a conversation about the importance of countering denial. Or if we talk about Heratin, and, and, and this one, again, it's uh, fascinating. I can, there's 55,000. I hope you're willing to be here for a little longer than my 12 minutes as I go through all of the, the stories from the archive. Um, but he talks about the one and a half million and then he makes it personal. And this is how we can bring students and individuals and humanity back to the point that genocide doesn't happen to six million or one and a half million or what the big numbers are. It happens to individuals. These individual lives are what we need to focus on. And if we can listen to these voices, these 55,000 voices, they talk about horror and, and hate as much as they talk about love and beauty, we can start to close that gap we can make it relatable. And if we can make it relatable and we can build that empathy, then we can start to help students fathom not only how genocides happen, why they happen, and hopefully fathom how they can contribute to stopping them. And I think that's my time. Thanks.